Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dublin Feminist Film Festival's Masterclass Stories from the Frontline with Ireland's finest filmmaker, Ashton Walsh. Ashton is a multi award winning screenwriter and director you know, of incredible film, the Song for a Raggy Boy, which became a seminal piece of work in Irish cinema. And Maudie, which she has won numerous awards worldwide, including an IFTA and the Canadian Screen Award for Best Director. She also has a BAFTA for her award winning uh, series Room at the Top. They're all very excited, and I'm not going to waste any more time. So we're going to get on with it. And we have a 45 minute um, masterclass with Ashton herself, and then a 15 minute QA. So if you have any questions, can you please put them in the QA box? And we'll try to answer as many as possible. Thank you. And enjoy. Good. So, if uh, what we might do, Tanya, if there's a lot of questions, you know, we can stop here. You just remind me of the time we get to kind of half yep. an hour. Um, so, hello, everybody, um, and uh, welcome. I'm delighted actually to be able to join uh, this festival today. Um, I'm in my house in London, so I'm a distance away, but it's uh, lovely to join everybody. I've heard a lot about it over the years. Really today is for everybody who's joined and who's listening in. Um, and, you know, whatever questions people may have, whether it's to do with what we talk about or not, just ask, you know, the question that, that you feel you need answered and I'll try and answer whatever I can. So whatever you want to, um, ask about that, that's uh, fine. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on, because I know the overall theme for uh, this festival this year is um, care and uh, connection. And uh, I think as, you know, directors and, and writer directors, um, that's actually one of the kind of most important things when you're kind of starting out with a story that you're going to, you know, bring to the screen. And whether yeah, you're a writer writing a screenplay or, or you know, director who's going to direct that screenplay, whether you've written it or not, that kind of, you know, connection to story is something that throughout my career has been very important. I've actually walked away from things that, uh, you know, that maybe came to me that I might have done quite well, but I didn't connect with the material. And I think that's the first thing because uh, certainly over the years in my career, you know, it takes a long time to make a movie. So you've got to really, you know, connect the material, love it and really care about it. I mean, it's like kind of nurturing this child in a way. Um, and, and maybe it, kind of you know leaves home <laughs> maybe it doesn't um you know so many things that you sort of worked on for a long time that don't kind of come to light for you know whatever reason but I think you know one of the most important things is to kind of connect with that story or connect with the material that you're interesting interested in adapting you know for the screen I mean I go back to things like you know Raggy Boy that uh you know, was from, it was the middle part of a trilogy written by Patrick Elvin. And I just loved it when I read it and I really connected with what that material, what that story was about really. I felt also that it's something that I could probably do quite well. Um, and I really took care over the years and it took 12 years to get that to the screen from the moment I first wrote you know, from the moment we first wrote that draft, um, 12 years later, we actually started to kind of turn over. So it's a long time. And in that time, you know, things change and things happen. Um, you know, detail, um, you know, in that broader um, uh, story of the industrial schools, not necessarily Patrick's experience, you know, came to light over the period of that, time and so you know some of those things you know I put into the script over the years so but that's sometimes the length of time that you're looking at you know it's something like Maudie which um only took three years for me but took 10 for the producers before they came to me again the same thing you know the care of that story because 
both, you know, Raggy and, and Maudie are based on true stories, you know, and it's really important as the sort of film author, if you like, that you get, uh, that you can kind of stand by it and get it right and get it as truthful as you feel that you can. And I felt that with Maudie. I mean, I remember the first night I read that script thinking, you know, it's about a painter and I was originally trained as a painter and I'd always wanted to make a film about a painter and here was this amazing story about this uh, little folk artist that, you know, I had the opportunity to kind of, you know, um, maybe direct and, you know, bring to the screen. And so a lot of careful, I do, I, I do a lot of research, whether I've written something or not. I mean, obviously if, if I'm writing something, then, you know, the research goes on for, you know, for a long time before I even, kind of write the first scene but if I'm joining something that's you know written by somebody else as Maudie was and you know we're going to kind of collaborate to you know eventually make that film then I do my own research I like to really find out I did a lot of research you know about her um, about Maud Lewis the painter and that kind of little part of the world that she lived in in Nova Scotia. I remember the, one of the very first things I asked the producers uh, when I went out to um, meet them, because it was easier for one of me to go than five of them to come this part of the world, was that I wanted to stop in Halifax in Nova Scotia on the way and see her house, which exists as an exhibit in the art gallery. You know, they took her, the original house, that really is an artwork, and it, it's her finest piece of art actually in my opinion and, and and you know I just wanted to kind of get a sense of what that 12 foot by 12 foot little house you know was like I mean for people who don't know the film um Maud Lewis lived in the middle of nowhere you know um and moved in with this um man who she eventually married into a 12 foot by 12 foot shack and she lived and she painted there for the next 30 years and that's what the film is really you know about and, and so they're the things that I think are really important when you you know when you start out and it kind of goes you know right through you know you're casting you know an actor to play any of those roles like Aidan Quinn and in, in you know in Raggy Boy and um Sally Hawkins in in, in you know Maudie Ethan Hawke in Maudie you've really got to connect with those actors I often say to you know, um, young filmmakers and students that are, you know, studying film, don't cast an actor that you don't connect with. It's not going to work. You know, it's just not going to work for you. And there's awful lot of pressure on sometimes now. Um, I'm sure some of the, you, you know, some of you have come across it where there's pressure on to cast, you know, somebody that's relatively, you know, maybe quite well known that might get the film out there a bit more or if it's you know I should talk a bit about television because that's a whole other kind of uh, world that I've been involved in right throughout my career it's the same thing you know who what who is go you know what name will get people to switch on on you know Sunday night on BBC for a single drama you know I made in 2019, well, just before uh, we went into lockdown, I came out, I made a, a BBC one film, an adaptation of a novel uh, called Elizabeth is Missing and I cast Glenda Jackson. Um, and that was my idea. That's who I thought of when I read that script. And uh, there she is, thank you so much. I forgot. So there she is at 84 years of age for people who uh, I'm sure most people know who she is, but if you don't, she's a twice Oscar winner. Um, and I mean, an incredible actor at 84 years of age, the first time on screen in 27 years, because in this country, she was an MP, she was a Labour uh, government minister for 25, over 20 years. Um, and that's the little girl who played her younger on the left-hand side in the green Cardigan, Sophie Rundle being buried in the sand. There they both are together. Um, so, you know, with a piece like that, where you've got, um, 
you know, an 84 year old character, you know, there was kind of a discussion about, well, should we go 10 years younger? And I said, well, no, you know, because it says the first line, second line in your script, you have Andrea Gibbs script said, Maud, 84 years of age, there she is, you know, so you've really, um, would that enable, you know, I kept saying to him, look, the way to um, sell this, because it's not, you know, dare I say, one of the dames, is to say, here is this actor who hasn't been seen on screen for 27 years, and this is her return to, you know, the screen, and that's actually what they did, and she ended up winning a BAFTA for that role. So that's sometimes, for me, as a director, the thing I care most about is who I cast in, in, I think it's the most important, well, I think the most important decision you make is deciding you want to do something, um, particularly if you're, you know, um, going to join something as a director with a project that you haven't written, um, because you've got to be able to collaborate with those people that are maybe already kind of existing, like Andrea Gibb on this film, for example, there's a script that came to me. Um, and you've got to really connect with that. And then, you know, the most important thing after that, when you've got a script for me, it's not for everybody, but for me is who I cast in something. Because then you can fly, you know, you get somebody like Glendy, you know immediately what she can do and what she's going to bring to it. And you can, it just elevates, you know, the film. The same with Sally. I think we have some pictures maybe of, um, yeah, there's Sally in, in Maudie for people who haven't seen the film. Her life's work is behind her. She painted uh, the interior of this house over the course of 30 years. I'm sure it changed over time. And when I read the script, because it, there, that, that's, um, we had to recreate that. That's the house as it exists in the Art Museum in Halifax in Nova Scotia. And every piece of it down to Above the cupboard, there's a picture of two little dogs, the bread bin. We replicated every inch of that. There's a picture on the back wall. You can't see what it is, but we, I mean, you know, we got it as near as, as, as we could. We built it slightly larger, a foot in each direction larger. Um, and so you've really got to, you know, fall in love with that. I mean, to go back to Sally, when I read the script that night, that's what I, I thought of. And I had it because she had to age from her late 20s into her late 60s. And that's her midway in the photograph you're looking at now. And, you know, so she goes from quite a young woman to, you know, quite an elderly um lady and also has a disability so we had to track that and I you know and, and and work on that without you know very no prosthetics really Sally did it herself and I knew I'd worked with Sally probably about eight years before this and we'd always wanted to work together again and this just sort of you know this seemed right and so for me you know it, there she is in the later stages you know it's um and it is an incredible kind of transformation. But if you look at all of that, that's our set. You know, you look at all of that detail. What I work very closely with the, and then maybe it's because of my background, with the art department. I mean, down to those little ornaments on the back window, on the shelf, you know, on the window, all of those things are just sort of, you know, feel right. And you've got to kind of figure out how to, achieve all of that, how to achieve her. There's Ethan as a younger man in the film. Um, it was very important for me in the script. It didn't, that had it in and I think that had it out that we knew that he'd come from an orphanage, that he was somebody who had no family. And so really the kind of course of his um, journey is kind of looking for companionship and looking for a family and she really becomes his family. I think we picked her of him later on as well, older. Uh, there's, there's a, yeah, there's um, Aiden and Raggy Boy, for example. I mean, I think one of the most uh, important things in that film were the casting of those boys. I kept saying, and the producers are aware of this, you know, that the, you know, once we got Aidan um, and we got Ian Glenn, who's a friend of mine and I'd worked with, and I thought he would play that 
you know, brother, but look at those faces. And, you know, sometimes we find ourselves, this is 1939 to 1940, they're kind of period faces, they're not modern kids. Um, you know, some of them are kind of quite thin and gaunt looking and, you know, they have a look about them. And I also, you know, said to, you know, the producers, every child's got to look different because they're in a uniform and we've got to be able to recognise, oh, that's him at 24 or 30. That, that was, you know, quite a huge job to kind of get those kids. Again, you know, same thing if you're casting children, you've got to really connect with them because your connection with those, my connection with those boys in that film made it what it is. Without that, it would be half the film it is, you know, in, in, you know, in many ways. Um, and Aidan, who was brilliant with them. Um, and again, that detail of, you know, getting those things right, those uniforms. I, I, I eventually found some research somewhere where, you know, the boys were all known by number rather than name. And so, you know, costume uh, stitched the numbers onto the jumpers that they wore and, you know, onto the ends of their beds, the art department, you know, those sort of fine kind of detail. And, and if we just hold on this picture for a minute, there's, um, this is a handball alley in the school that we eventually found. The other thing that's really important for me is location, you know, that you connect with it, you know. Um, most of this film is set in this institution. Um, and we needed various things, classrooms and um, dormitory and, you know, the, uh, the refectory where they eat. But this, and we scoured the country. And I remember the night I saw the pictures of this location, which is in, in Ballyvorney in County Cork. And it's not an industrial school. It was a training college for uh, religious brothers. And this is a handball alley. And when I went to see this location, I mean, you just walk in and it kind of, we've been to many places and I just thought this is it, you know, um, because it had everything and, you know, and if not, we could kind of create what we needed. And I used this handball alley quite a bit. It wasn't in the script before I found this location. So that's really important too. I mean, I've on occasions find myself a bit strapped in a location, not maybe for reason of schedule or, or more scheduled than anything else. It won't be a hugely important location maybe but it's really important that you can stand there and look at it and feel you can film anything in that place I mean that's really important for me and again that's that care of you know trying to you know say to you know whoever the location scout is this is what you're looking for you know I often gather up reference pictures um, and, you know, when you sort of first meet, you know, location manager, say, look, this is the kind of thing. I've just sent some pictures of Chernobyl actually off to a producer in um, America to talk about the texture and feel of something that we're looking for in the future. So those things are... Or, or, you know, you really got to connect with that location and stand there and feel good about it and see pictures. Um, when I was at um, film school in the um, early 80s, um, at the National Film School in Beaconsfield here in England, um, I was very fortunate to have a shooter called Bill Douglas, a Scottish filmmaker, who made an amazing trilogy about his childhood. And I, you know, Bill kind of encouraged me to write, but also I remember him saying, you know, when you stand out there in that location, see, you know, you've got to be able to see the picture that you first wrote about. And if you can, then, you know, you're probably in the right place. Now that doesn't happen necessarily all the time. You know, this had its budgetary kind of requirements as well. And it, may, it meant we had to find everything in one place because we were going to go down to West Cork or Galway or wherever it is, it just so happens we ended up in West Cork. 
no vans, no trucks, everything was kind of delivered off, the lights, the ca- everything. And we, when we did have to go out, which was, I think, on two or three occasions, we went in a little kind of van with everybody. So that, you know, we didn't have endless trucks toing and froing and whatever. But there's something about that location that kind of worked so amazingly well. It's another character in this film. And I did a year before this, don't have any pictures of um, a film called Sinners, which is about the Magdalene laundries. And we shot that down in um, a convent in Clifton and Galway, which had the remnants of a, a laundry. And it just makes it so kind of, and also these are all true, you know, a lot of my career has been based on true stories. So, uh, you know, that, kind of care has got to be taken when you're dealing with subject matter matter like this you get one chance to make this kind of film that tells the story of these industrial schools or that tells the story of the Magdalene Laundries or that tells the story of this female artist that um so it's really important that those things are you know that 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 care and attention is uh, kind of taken if we have a look I, I, I just if we can have a look at the workbook um, um yeah so when I um let me go back and look at some of those things yeah brilliant so I know if we just kind of flick through so there's my scri- what I do is it's kind of crazy and it's very old-fashioned but it's how I work and it kind of works for me so I buy one of those big um, A4 kind of hard cover notebooks. Sometimes they're quite fancy, sometimes they're not. I put my script on the left-hand side, as you see there, and highlight, and I kind of doodle. I'm trying to think what that is. Okay, and that's another way of doing it. I work with two DOPs, actually. That's, this is what we did. That's a rehearsal, actually. If you look very closely down at the bottom photograph on the left hand side and the one above it you'll see Kenneth Brown it's a Wallander that I did and this is a um, scene at the very end of the film where uh, Claire Cox the girl playing the kind of murderous in it is, is, is shot um, and they closed the station for us one evening for about an hour so we could, people thought I was crazy you know got, you know got to rehearse there because it's one of those things you need three cameras on it and you've really just got to see, you can't, you know, you can't have actors arriving and thinking, well, how are we going to do this? At least if you know how you're going to do it. Um, and so we rehearsed it for about an hour and a half. And these are the pictures that my DOP took just so as we can remember what we can see. Now, whether they all end up in the film or not doesn't matter. It gives you a good guide to kind of what we need maybe to tell the story. If we go on to keep going there, to, yeah, that again is a um, very simple scene, very important scene in the film, actually, with somebody he goes to see. These are just sort of flavours of what, just so you don't forget, um, you know, the same here. I mean, you know, that's me in the, on the left in the middle picture, you know, standing in, because that's sometimes what you have to do. Well, actually, in all of those pictures, um, with your DOP, sometimes that's what you got to do just to see, it. you know, just so I go between that and sometimes you've got to draw, but keep going. Uh, Tanya. Yeah. Um, means nothing. Means nothing to anybody, but means a lot to me, you know. Um, and if you go right down to the very end of the, yeah, if we just go through them, just flash through, you kind of get the idea of the thing. Um, that's room at the top. These are all different films. Uh, that's um, it is, okay. That if go back to that picture. Yeah, that's the very first little image I drew. That the, it, it's quite an important little scene in the film. And actually, funnily enough, it's how we shot it in the end. You know. Um, so if we go on from there down to it's a picture at the very end with a yeah. That's if we just go back once, as we can see Glenda. So I'll go back one more. Yeah. So what I often do as well is um, Glenda's characters, a lot of the scenes in the film 
were in her house, her character's house. So I brought her out to have a look at the house and, and you know, it's where out of the four or five weeks filming, I think we were there for about three weeks. And just to see her in that setting, that's just her and her ordinary, you know, we brought her out one afternoon in the DOP and it's nice. Somebody like that gets to know your DOP quite well, who's also operating. I don't know how people like to work. Sometimes it's separate people. I like to have a collective photography who operates as well. And so, you know, you get that nice kind of communication going. And she feels sort of part of it and she knows where she's going to come to. And, you know, and then if we just go on to more to the very end, this, uh, yeah, that. So I often, in the very beginning, um, that's in, behind my desk in the production office in Glasgow where we made Elizabeth is Missing, just put pictures together that mean something. Um, so that people can see and just start to kind of work those up. It's interesting, you know, when you see that, the colours of it and the man sitting in that dark, but with the kind of sun coming through the window is something that we sort of used. and. I look at still photographs a lot. Uh, so that's kind of an idea of, of you know, of that. Um, now, if we could go to the directing one, I just think people are, yeah, okay. So people are off interested just to see. Okay, that's me in my very first film. That's a wonderful Irish actor called Andrew Connolly. It's a film I made in 1988. I, when, I mean, I knew nothing, he knew nothing. <laughs> Um, I'd written this script and we got the money to make uh, this film. And that's on um, the cafe in Bray, County Wicklow, that we had a huge scene in. Um, I think with a couple of scenes, there was one kind of particularly huge scene where he meets the main woman in the film for the first uh, time. And if we go on, uh, that's me with the main um, girl. Actually, I got that picture blown. That's on room. I got that picture blown up for her last week. It was her 60th birthday for a present. On we go. That's lovely. That's on room at the top. Obviously, rehearsing with um, Matthew. Um, and again, a very tricky pe People may know the film room at the top that was made in the 50s. Uh, a lot of the single films I've done are for BBC Four or television films. And this is one that they... I'm trying to think when I did it, 2012 or 13, 2012. Um, and, you know, not a huge amount of time, not a huge amount of budget, but, you know, great freedom to, you know, to do something. And it was a complicated piece. It's about, you know, set after the war, about a young man um, coming back from the war, 1947, 48, you know, still rationing in the north of England. It's really about, you know, how do you kind of break through the class system? He has an affair with um, quite a well-heeled married woman. Um, anyway, this is, you know, seen when he first arrives in the lodgings that he's um, staying in. But it's interesting, I kind of look, uh, part of the reason I'm showing these pictures is, you know, there's a great, um, I kind of started in the industry without a monitor, there's no such thing. So you stood beside your, DOP who was operating, you looked at a rehearsal through the camera and you went, you know, and you did a couple of takes and they said they got all, you know, whatever. And so I do the same with actors. I tend not to, nowadays I might have a small size of an iPad, you know, um, monitor. I like to kind of, you know, sort of stay on set. So um, on we go from there. Yeah, that's, <laughs> we went back, um, for two days filming on Maudy for snow um, because there was no snow when we, we shot one side of Christmas. I think we finished in the middle of November and they knew they weren't going to get snow. And so we took two days off the schedule and I went back in January and that's um, us in the, I mean, I think there were like five crew and Ethan and Sally. It was a really lovely way to work. Um, and there he is in, um, getting ready for his wedding. There I am on set, you know, with him. And it's just interesting to kind of see what uh, that's obviously grabbed off uh, 
a monitor, you know, and we're obviously talking about the same there. Obviously, who knows what I'm we're talking about. But just they're just interesting to kind of see these little background. That's the two of them kind of towards the end of uh, the film. Um, another, yeah, and that's me with Glenda. It's one of the last scenes in the film. Uh, on our on on I think our last day. Um, they're just interesting, you know. Still, that's me sitting in again in a tenement um, building in, in in Glasgow. The designer actually took that. We had a scene uh, similar with the girl kind of sitting in. It's just sometimes it just it's just nice to. I like to kind of gather that sort of stuff and then you can show that to an actor and I, on this occasion actually there was um, a fight on this staircase and I brought the young actress out on a she came in a recce with us and and then we went the stunt arranger there and you know we kind of went through it so I like to do that with actors too where you know I you know where I can I think that's Sophie Rundle who people know from Peaky Blinders in I did um Again, for BBC Four, uh, an adaptation of uh, An Inspector Calls. Uh, she plays the girl in that, and that's Tom Hollander in um, Poet in New York. I was asked for Dylan Thomas's centenary. BBC Four wanted to make um, a film and um, asked me if I'd like to do it. This is interesting because I people who know New York and know of the Chelsea Hotel, that sign is so iconic. And he lived, he was staying there actually the night he he died. And in fact, this if people who've been, there's a plaque on the wall that says out of here on whatever date it was, sailed, you know, the great Dylan Thomas never to return. And obviously, we couldn't go to New York. I mean, so this was, um, this is just a tryout. Actually, it looked, you know, so much better than this. This is um, a, you know, with a lot of visual effects participation. But that sign and that balcony were built on the ground floor of uh, the location that we used for the hotel room. So you could walk from the hotel room out onto that, balcony and we put that sign in you know it's so it just looked you know so sort of worthwhile doing because you get the kind of flavor of New York you know and the rest then is all um visual effects you know and that's just a kind of a try out of what it could look like um uh, here we go there's the snow there's the little house that we built uh yeah, just go through. That's Matt and uh, Michael again, rather Maxine Peak, um, who played the main lady in it. Oh. But all of these things are, yeah, if we just spin through them. I'll... Now for this, you know, Tom had to put on two stone because it's at the end of, you know, Dylan's life. Actually, it's two time periods. It goes back 10 years prior. So we shot, this part of it first and then he kind of stopped eating and kind of slimmed back a bit for the last couple of days uh, for you know when he was younger so you know that's the commitment that he had you know you're trying to I found a book that 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 portrait of him you can see there how how we, that that's kind of robbed from a, a book there was a stills photographer that traveled with him that last tour that he did in America and down to the, you know, the bow tie that he's wearing and the clothes, or there's a, there's a suit of of his, which are there the trousers of, of Dylan's that are in the museum in Swansea in Wales, and they let us take it out and and use it to make um, a suit for Tom. That that's Dylan's house in the background in Larne. We filmed there. I mean, we couldn't film inside because it's too small, but you know, we brought it back. Uh, painted it uh, with a wash and kind of added what it looked like at the time um, and that's us in 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 Lawrence so again you know just that 
sort of care and you know Tom really committed himself to that role you know and so you've got to um yeah that's him as a young boy so that's they're the kind of images from that it's interesting you see things together but yeah on we go um yeah so that's an interest if we go back at that yeah so that you see that's something that's kind of quite in you know when you've got to cast an older actor and then find her younger self at kind of 15 or 16 and you look at those two together it's I mean Liv Hill is just incredible I mean such a great match um, and that's something that I really battled for or not you know but really really went on about it. I said it's got to be right she's got to have you know because you don't want actors that I mean okay if you've got dye your hair fair enough but you know you don't want to kind of get into colored lenses and they, all of that and they're just facially just so alike you don't ask yourself for my I've seen it done so badly um so that's kind of sometimes something interesting that you've got to do and what Liv did was she came along and met Glenda and we kind of worked together and she came out and saw us when we were filming and just picked up little things little details of Glenda's that she sort of used herself which is you know interesting um that's her yeah yeah we've seen all that yeah I think that's about it yeah Me with Glenda. So, Ashton, have you ever been in a situation where, um, you know, you've you're on set with an actor and you can't find that connection? Um, if you ever have been in that situation, what have you done to kind of really, you know, find a common ground and find that connection? To <laughs> yeah, it can happen. You know, I'm trying to think has it happened um it's usually sometimes if you kind of inherit something you know so somebody say maybe attached to something before you do you just got to work at it you know because really ultimately what you're trying to find or achieve is the finest performance you can from that actor or actress you know that performer and um one hopes that that doesn't happen um but if it does you just got to work at it you just got to and and you know sometimes with those actors you know we're inclined to give a lot of maybe when we start out in you know your career you're sort of what so want to get it right you give sort of so many notes and things sometimes it's something very simple it needs to be slower or it needs to be um we need it needs to be a little sort of you know sadder than that or whatever it is you know there there are things that actors kind of get a sense of and you've just got to you know uh be is there any, brave about it is there any specific tools that you can give any directors here that might maybe have been in a situation before and um, where they're just not getting what they want to do with the actor um is there any specific tools that you can help um, maybe an emerging director to overcome? Well, I think, you know, our, the fear is that you're not going to kind of achieve the scene. So let's say, for example, there's a scene, you've got two actors in a scene and, you know, one of them isn't kind of, you know, getting it. So they, therefore, they, what the other actors may be expecting to kind of get from that actor isn't happening either. And I think... You know, you can keep going and going and going, you know, but by take 30, it's not going to get any better. You know, it's, you know, my feeling is that really, you know, mostly you sort of achieve it in, you know, the first few takes. That's the magic of, I think, what, you know, we sort of do. I, I mean, my advice would be to try and, I mean, first of all, to kind of get to know actresses, you know, when I mean do tests, sometimes you need to test your lenses, you know, so you get an actor right and say, listen, can we just put you in your costume and, you know, try and 
work with that. I mean, I had Ethan Hawke a day before we started, actually the night before we started filming, he arrived. So I had to really, you know, we'd met twice before that, really find that kind of connection. You've just got to keep, you know, talking and keep um, just sort of trying to kind of, you know, get to know them. You'll figure out after a day or so how actors achieve are they better in take one or take two? Some actors need a little bit of warm up time, others don't, you know, but let's say you are not getting it at all. I think you've got to change something and maybe what you've uh, got to change is the, you know, make the scene simpler maybe. Uh, um, I very rarely struggle with that. You know, I've, I've sort of usually found a way, you've just got to, but what you can't do, is make the actor feel as though that they're not kind of getting there for you. You know, you've got to say, listen, that's great. But listen, how about we try it like this and just give yourself choices, you know, because when you get into the cutting room, you might use for half the scene, take two, and you might choose take five for the other half of the scene, you know, and go back to take two again. So really sometimes... You're not looking for, don't look for, if it's not working, don't look for the overall thing in one go because it's not going to happen. You think, okay, I've got that bit of the scene and now I need to kind of get this bit of the scene. And people get, actors get very frustrated if they know it's a wide shot and you're doing it 10 times and they're delivering major dialogue. And, um, and you know, by the time you get around to say maybe they're close up, it's in the at four o'clock in the afternoon, they're knackered. So, you know, funnily enough, I when I worked with um, Kenneth Brown on, on Wallander, he said to me, you know, do you think you could shoot my close up first in most of the scenes? And I'm thinking, Christ almighty. Wow, how am I going to do that? Well, actually, mostly we could, you know, because he just yeah. felt, you know, you, you're miles out, you know, you're far away and, and or you kind of say to the actors, listen, it's not important, you know, we're just going to kind of run this. It's also a habit now of, because we're digital. I mean, my training was on film. So my um, uh, feeling on set is, my discipline on set is very much like that. You know, turn over, action, cut, stop, and on we go. And I don't wait for people to kind of, that's why I like to be on the floor, because I like to go into the actor and within. 25 seconds you're going again if you want to go again whereas with digital it's oh let's keep running let's get you go back out start so you're losing something every time because it's all a bit oh oh right you know whereas yeah. if you know you got to kick that door in and you're looking I, I remember on Raggy Boy I had a cast and actor called Mark Warren um, and the producers know this I mean I had really fought for him because we only had a certain amount of money and I, I remember saying to him at the point listen give him some of my fee because I we need this guy we just he's going to make something so he's he'd be great he'll do something with this part which is really all of six scenes and actually you look at the film and he's in a far more you know it's so it's a really crucial role in the film but the first scene we did with him you know he comes into this classroom full of boys it's the end of the film towards the end of the film in tears kind of, you know saying I could, there's nothing I could do, you know, the main boy in the films after been kind of, we've seen kind of being beaten. Um, and, you know, I would say to an actor that's delivering like that emotion, just come through the door, shows where you're going to be or where you think you might be, and that's fine, you know. And we did that with two cameras running because I had with the children. Um, so we could kind of, you know, grab a lot of stuff and he comes through that, the, you know, we're down at the back of the classroom. We've turning over and you know and I said to him take your time coming through the door you know you know 10 seconds 12 seconds and we comes through that door like a rocket and all I could hear <laughs> I'm standing in between the two cameras all I can hear from the two kind of cameramans oh fuck you know I mean they couldn't believe that he got to that place so sometimes you've got to let an actor walk out of a room it may say you know, the scene starts when they're sitting there. Well, maybe, you know, during rehearsal, they need to kind of walk out that door and come back in again. You've got to find those little things that are, maybe it's a prop that's awkward that's kind of throwing them their costume. Um, I always go to actress costumes 
the costume fittings for that reason, particularly with young eyes, so they're not kind of stuffed into something they don't feel happy in. I couldn't act if I wasn't in the clothes. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. all, all, all of those things are, and generally then you get there because you get to know those actors, you know, and, and see that kind of transformation happening. Um, but if you're out there and it's four o'clock in the afternoon and you got to wrap at five or it's five and you got to wrap at six and you're thinking, I'm never going to get there. You've just got to go in stages and try and, you know, sometimes you're down to line by line, you know, if it's, um, you know, a, 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 an older actor, you know, you might be in that situation where it happened very early on in my career, you know, you're there line by line, you know, and that's what you've got to do. And they've got to put their trust in you. I've often stood in for an artist, you know, if we've kind of gone on, you want to kind of, you know, keep going with the scene. Um, and, uh, you, you know, you just got to keep trying, uh, but keep telling them it's great. You know, it's, you know, yeah. the last thing you want to do don't is do, then don't upset your actor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you're directing since the eighties, which I can't imagine there were many female directors in Ireland at the time and, you know, you're still going. What do you think is is what gave you that longevity in this industry and allowed you to break through as a female because we're still underrepresented in the industry. And there's a, a question here from Ashton who says, what advice would you give a young director starting out? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is I didn't think about it at the time, you know. I thought I want to make films. I knew I wanted to do that. I never really thought beyond, I, you know, I didn't think, oh, I'm a woman that wants to make films. I just thought I want to make films. The first films I made actually with a fellow student at the art school in Dunleary, you know, we made films together. I did camera, you know, or, or sound on his films and he did the same for me. And then I heard about a place called the National Film School in Beaconsfield, which is why I came to live in England. And in that year, there weren't that many girls and we were all filmmakers it's different there now it's specialized we're all filmmakers I think there were like four or five girls um and of course you come out of that place and everybody you know it's it's still you know probably one of the best film schools in the world so it gives you that kind of confidence I suppose in a way and I never thought about it I wrote a script I brought around to uh well, it's the BFI now, but British Screen as it was at the time. And I said, this, I yes. want to make a film. And, you know, suddenly two years later, I'm making that film. It's what happens after that. It's, you know, it's like a musician. It's, you know, well, not quite because filmmaking is expensive, but, you know, it's easier to make your first film than it is to make your second film. Um, and then television really in the in kind of the world didn't, Ex uh, you know, people go really going into television, you know. And I thought after you know, I'd worked for a long time on a film that never went, and I thought, you know, I've really got to learn about this, and um, you know, and so I went into, I got down on my knees, she <laughs> begged them to kind of let me in to do uh, direct some television, and that's how I've always gone between the two things, you know. And you learn, I couldn't make the films. That, I make and have made without the television I've made and vice versa because one informs the other you know I mean they yeah. you know you get used to schedules and all that battling away for stuff you know it's none of it is from the get-go you're battling away for things um how have I kept going you know I just keep going you know you just keep finding things you want to do I don't think I've done anything it's kind of look back and think I uh, for this you know you sometimes look back and think oh better try and find some photos oh yeah I forgot you know something on the other night that I directed five years ago and I sat and watched the last 15 minutes of it and I thought oh, wow. you know um I don't revisit things but you know you kind of keep moving on it's that's I can't do anything else you know yeah um, I'm very lucky I can write. Um, I would say to people, if you don't, then try and find somebody that you want to collaborate with and find stories that you want to, you know, make. I mean, it is a long, you know, listen, 
the beauty of this is that you can still look at Glenda Jackson, 84. She's my new role model, you know. Um, I've had sort of huge gaps where, you know, as I said, Raggy Boy took 12 years. I did, you know, some television in between. I did some writing in between, you know. Um, I haven't gone from kind of film to film to film, you know, just, it doesn't happen. I mean, what I would say now is, um, and I remember, in te you know, the very first television I did, I was the only woman. I did a show called The Bill, which trained a lot of people at the time at Thames Television. And I was the only female director out of, I think there might have been 12 directors there at the time. And then another woman started after me. I mean, I did all in all, I think about eight episodes, but over a period, over about a year. Um, <clears throat> but it's not something you noticed, you know, I've worked with my, at the time, you know, because that's the way the world was, you know, you just thought, well, you know, I never, you just went out and, and go in and do it, did it. And you never thought, wow, this is kind of, I'm different to anybody else. It's not how I saw myself, you know, I mean, it's different now. I think it's a fun, an amazing opportunity, um, you know, for women filmmakers. And I, you know, um, in the, you know, I think particularly in the last sort of two or three years. And it's also, it goes back to that very thing, you know, how do you want to be a painter? Well, if you haven't seen one, how do you know? You know, you need to kind of see these things. You need to know that it's possible. It's like somebody saying, I want to be an astronaut. If I'd said in my family home as a as a teenager, I want to be an astronaut, to go fine, go ahead, you know, um, rather than saying no, you can't, you got to go and and you know, you know, whatever it might have been at the time, um, and so you've got to know that those things exist, you know, and now we kind of know that these things, you know, exist, um, or or you know, we can be part of this world, you know, and, and the film you know, business from, you know, costume to design to, I often, you know, when you're out and film, you're really up against it, you know, and you often sit there and think, God, I wish I was in the costume department. I wouldn't have this crazy <laughs> responsibility. I just all I have to make sure is the costumes are, you know, neat. anyway, it's not quite true. It's, it's a, and also it's a collaboration, you know, all of it. But you just you just keep finding things. I just keep finding things I want to do, you know, and I don't uh, it, it's never mattered to me at what level it's at, as in whether it's a no budget like Poet New York was made in, in 15 days. You know, that doesn't matter to me. I can do that. I don't need a huge amount of money. I don't need a huge amount of resources, but I need time up at the front. I'll always say to people, I need time at the beginning to find these locations, to find these things. You know, I'd say to young filmmakers, if you're starting out and you join, you know, a something that's already existing, you know, you're coming on to direct, it, say, a block of, you know, some fairly, you know, mega big, you know, television or, you know, I mean, it's a low budget single film. Just get that time with you and your designer, and maybe your DOP. My DOPs don't start prep at like six weeks out. They'll come for kind of two days much earlier on. You know, those kind of things. Find out what works for you, you know. Um, and I'm still trying to find out what works for me, you know. It's different on every project and the battles are different. And it is, I've become less, um, I've become more fearless, you know, in, in with those kind of things as, as, as time has kind of gone on, you know, those things that are really important to me, as I said, you know, cast and who I work with, the yeah. DOP, those things are kind of important to me, you know. We just um, have an, another really interesting question here from Caroline, who says she, um, it's great to see your, your workbooks. And have you any tips on pitching a project for funding, particularly for first time feature directors? Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? I, one of the things that um, I've written down here uh, is that, you know, eh, well, it, it, you know, it depends. I imagine, Caroline, hello, how are you? I imagine that, let's say, we talk about Ireland for the moment. You, you know, one, you know, you've maybe made a couple of short films and now you want to kind of progress on to, you know, move to the next stage of just making feature film, whether you've written it or not, is, is kind of irrelevant. 
what people, what financiers need is security all the time. You know, security that you can do it in six weeks or five weeks or whatever it is for the money that you've got, for the schedule that you've got. Um, and it's uh, so much of it is that, you know, um, I started to do those sort of lookbooks and workbooks because it helped me, um, you know, somebody, you know, the first question always is what's it going to look like? Well, you go, well, that's, you know, what it's, you know, if you've one picture even, and they go, oh, that's interesting. You go, oh, yeah, that's, um, you know, Tina Madotti and it's this and that. That gets the conversation going and then you can show them something else. I would never go to a meeting without a, a kind of a lookbook. Even the one for Maudie that I did when I was going out to meet those producers, I did it in, in a car driving back from, I mean, I wasn't driving. Somebody was from Cardiff to London and on the internet just, you know, collecting things to put together and I printed it off you know when I got home so you've got that as your security blanket you know so I think what people want to know is one that they feel secure that you can pull it off two they get a very good idea of what it's going to look like and three whoever those main people are your actors the producer that's with you obviously and they should be really supportive of you and, and at that meeting with you too and a DOP that you that they feel that you know uh, can get there with you you know that'll kind of make it happen and maybe he maybe he or she has got to kind of you know supply kind of some pictures as well this is the look for these are the costumes and the more of that you can do you know, the better it's, it's, it, it, they just need to kind of feel that security. Um, and I think as young directors starting out, I look back to Joy Riders now, I think I knew nothing, but I had a DOP who I was at film school with and I had two actors that I loved and a really supportive producer. And then you just kind of get on and, you know, do it. It's, it's ultimately also, you know, these pitching sessions, they're thinking of the poster in their head, they're thinking, okay, whose name is above the title? What is that poster? Um, and how, you know, what kind of audience is this film going to attract? That's not really our job. You know, our job is to kind of make the best film that we can for the, you know, in the, in the, you know, when I, you know, when I made, say, Raggy, for example, the reason it took so long is people couldn't believe that story quite had happened, you know. Um, Maudie took that length of time because people couldn't figure out what the film was before I joined because they started off in a kind of a different place than where we kind of ended up in a way. Um, so it's really, and it's also, I would say, you've got to fight for the film you want to make. I mean, on Maudie, I fought for the film that I wanted to make with the actors that I wanted, because it's not worthwhile doing otherwise in, for me. And it's, that's always where I've started. You know, you need to be there on the first day, on the first take, when that camera turns over. For the first, I always go to that place. You've rehearsed the very first scene on the first day. You're they're checking costume, they're lighting, and you've got 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and you stand in a space in your own. I always do this and stand in a space and I think, right, in six weeks' time, will I've made a nice film? Will I've been fired? What other battles will I have to fight? Will we've run out of money? Will somebody come and take the camera away? In the meantime, I've just got to I get over that. And once you go turn over, you know, um take one and you're off and you forget that and you're like you know it's like a it's like a you know a horse race um but it's you know you've got also films are very personal you know and so they've got to feel the personality of um I think the best films are personal the more personality yeah, and more you know they've got to feel to that into your... yeah that personality you know and, and you get better at it as you go along you know, like I'm asked that question if I go to like the film I did with Glenn, what it's going to what's it going to look like? I mean, I put a lookbook together. I said, I don't know, actually, at the moment. 
I mean, it can look like anything you want. I don't actually just quite know at the moment, but here's two pictures. You know, sometimes it's as simple as that. If you're pitching an idea, then you're really, which is I think what you mean, Karen, then you've really got to know it inside out. This is a story about, you know, this is a story about a woman who, you know, uh, wanted to paint all her life, who actually found her voice through painting because she was, you know, because she was able to kind of do, I mean, you know, that's crap, but, you know, something like that one line, it's like, you know, what is the log line? I mean, the, the things in applications for money that take you the longest log line, two sentences that sort of tell your film, if you've got that written down before you go in, then, and I mean, it's like an actor auditioning, you know, honestly, you sometimes, you know, have to record yourself. If it's a really, big meeting then you know maybe talk through it with a pal you know your sister your brother your auntie whoever um but really what they need to see is that personality and that passion actually you know it's like with yeah. you know glenda i really wanted her and i remember saying to the head of drama at the bbc we were on the phone we were talking about it, i said i'm not getting off this phone to hear the word yes so whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes or 50 i don't mind i'll hold on um, and of course, you know, he said, of course, you know, so they're the things that they, you know, that being difficult. It's also making people feel as though they can, you know, collaborate because that's also important, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, this is all we have time for. Um, that was an incredible masterclass. It was absolutely brilliant to see your your lookbooks, how you work, um, so informative. And I hope everybody else has gotten what I have, Elva, and are excited and determined now to get their own projects off the ground. <laughs> I mean, just finally, just to say, because it is important, you know, you learn eventually the way that works best for you. Nobody said to me, this is how you got to work. This is how you, you find your own way. I think those things came out of me you know, coming from art school and coming from fine art that I kind of, you know, that makes sense to me. You know, pictures make sense to me and I can talk about feelings. You'll find your own way. And also out on set, um, and I say this for, well, for everybody, you know, um, don't get kind of shoved around. You really got to stand your ground. You know, I was talking to somebody recently and they were saying that they felt they'd no time uh, to rehearse because everyone's oh how, how, where are the lights going where you know you just say whoa hang on a minute here try and find if it works for you that may work for you that kind of mayhem with everybody I actually like to have actors on set on my own with my DOP actually as time has gone on um to rehearse and say okay what are we going to do here and then we show to everybody that works for me you know that may not work for it but then you know what you're doing and everybody knows what you're doing you know you'll find your own way as you go along and every project is different as well, you know, and every combination of people is different. But, you know, it's just important that, you know, I think if you feel comfortable, if I feel comfortable out and set with the people I'm with, I can fly. If I don't, I, I, it's difficult. It's not a um, okay. Have a lovely day, guys. Excellent. Is there thanks anything else before I go? Um, no, I think that's it. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. We have another masterclass um, tomorrow at two o'clock. And please look online for our, our, our programme. We have some gorgeous films, all from female uh, directors. And um, again, thanks a million for having us. Uh, Ashton, you're really, really, really lovely. Thanks a million and bye everyone. Bye. Thanks guys.